Thank you guys for joining us for another exciting uh, lecture. My name is Dr. Arash Akamian. Uh, for our uh, hundreds of thousands of viewers around the world, I am so excited today. I've been looking forward to uh, interviewing and hearing uh, what Dr. Bakli has, has uh, to say. Um, as you guys know, we have several uh, million views already, and uh, this, this platform has been viewed um, around the world, and I am really proud and honored today to get this message out. Uh, the topic of bone grafting, um, bone augmentation is one that has uh, really been a huge interest of mine. And so uh, I, I want to say hello to uh, Bach. How are you today, Dr. Lee? Great, great. It's so good to see you, uh, uh, Raj. Yeah, I'm thank doing you well. So yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Where, where are you? Uh, where are you today? Are you are you in Los Angeles? I'm actually today uh, in my house in uh, in Orange County, Newport Beach, and uh, hiding out in my son's room because the kids will be coming home in about uh, 30 minutes. They're going to be making a lot of noises, so I had to go hide in his uh, bedroom. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I was doing another interview, and uh, one of the one of the Dr. Nguyen, his 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 uh, son was walking in the in behind the uh, lecture, and he saw himself walking, and he immediately started. Uh, he ducked down. He crawled. <laughs> he was crawling out of the picture, and it was the most uh, hilarious thing. So wh whatever happens, we'll uh, I think we'll make the most of it. Uh, yeah, for yeah. those who don't know, uh, Dr. Buckley, um, I, I had the pleasure of first meeting him uh, when I graduated from USC. Um, he has, uh, I think he's been at USC for quite some time now. Uh, Dr. Bakley is an oral maxillofacial surgeon, currently practicing in private practice and a uh, professor at USC School of De Dentistry. Um, I believe he received his uh, oral maxillofacial degree at uh, Oregon Health uh, Sciences University. He has been a faculty at USC for um, about 20 years now, um, since since the year 2000. He's an international lecturer on bone regeneration, uh, dental implant related uh, surgeries. He's taught in six continents around the world, authored and co-authored um, many chapters in various textbooks on bone regeneration, dental implants, um, and, and has many peer reviewed articles in a variety of journals. Um, Doc, I, I, you know, I can go on and on about your uh, your resume and all the amazing things you've you've done. Actually, I I don't know if I ever mentioned this to you, but I actually saw one of your uh, one of your posts, one of your lectures, um, and you were posting about the vertical bone regeneration that you guys were working on at USC. And this was a couple of years ago. And my best friend Cameron Dasturi, who was uh, another uh, graduate uh, at USC, he went to LSU for oral surgery. Um, he was consulting with me. So he's like, Arash, what should I do? You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm at this great program. I was like, Cam, you don't know what I saw. I saw Dr. Buckley. He he, he literally was uh, increasing bone height um, all the way back up to the top where it used to be. This was like a, you know, a fully resorbed ridge. I said, get into bone surgery. And it's really interesting how uh, how the things that we put out there can have this butterfly effect. And he actually ended up um, taking that advice and working with Dr. Block. And, uh, and and really, I think this is one of the most fascinating areas for me. And I can't wait to wait to talk to you about it. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think you have a presentation uh, ready for us. Um, I would love to I'd love to let you get started. And then maybe we can take some time after to, to go over. And I have tons of questions I want to ask you. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Let's do it. All right. So. Perfect. Now, how do we get the first slide to, uh, or, or the slideshow yeah, to start? Maybe. Yeah, let's see. Maybe you can just go to uh, the view and slide view. Uh, press the view slideshow. Um, Maybe I can uh, I can pull in our uh, technical team to help out. 
while you're while you're getting that set up, Dr. Lee, um, for those who also, uh, who don't follow Dr. Lee, he is he's also probably one of the fittest uh, doctors in the world. I uh, I actually follow him. He's one of a, a couple of doctors who somehow manages to find time to uh, be a superstar uh, <laughs> athlete. I think he's doing triathlons and uh, he's heavily into martial arts. Uh, him and him and Bill Dorfman are t two I follow, and I, I'm constantly uh, <laughs> I'm constantly wondering how they find time to stay so fit between private practice, teaching, uh, and and all the other projects that they have going. Um, I think it's important to make sure, especially now more than ever, to to maintain our uh, physical health and our mental health. So I think that's one of the things that uh, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely want to ask Dr. Lee how he does it and how he manages to fit that into his busy schedule how's it going over there doc um i i i can't find the the uh the button, the uh, button. okay the, i mean it's the screen is being shared but how do you um let me stop sharing and then i'll yeah stop sharing and maybe do it again I think, uh, you know, I'll, I'll kind of just share. I'm I sure have the presentation here. Yeah. OK. You have it? Perfect. Awesome. Yeah. Let's do it. All okay. right. Let's do it. All right. So, you know, really an honor to present uh, on the topic uh, of vertical augmentation. And this uh, topic, you know, is going to be specifically with emphasis in the aesthetic zone, because uh, I think that's where a lot of the challenges are. And uh, this is a topic of a lot of controversy and a lot of uh, interest. Um, and so uh, uh, I think this uh, is, is going to be uh, stir up a lot of uh, discussion. Um, as we look at defects that, uh, that we see, especially in the aesthetic zone um, today, we see that there are numerous ways to treat these types of defects. Um, you don't need to look very far in the literature and you can see um, currently, these are accepted techniques being presented by numerous different authors on how to treat a particular defect, such as the one that I'm showing you. Um, I think that with the, uh, uh, you know, implants are extremely successful. Um, however, when they fail, they do cause a lot of bone loss. And when the removal of implants, especially in the front, uh, in the either anterior maxilla or anterior mandible, uh, often result in significant vertical defects. These types of defects in the past, you would see normally from resections, from tr heavy trauma or, or tumor. Now we see these routinely from failures of implants. Now, if you look at the techniques available, depending on um, who, uh, you know, what your background is, your training, um, where, which part of the world uh, uh, you are from, uh, you can either do bone blocks, bone plates, uh, a la the uh, Curie technique, uh, GBR, titanium mesh, uh, interpositional osteotomy, distraction. These are accepted techniques today in 2020. And so whenever I see a laundry list of topics of, uh, excuse me, uh, of techniques to treat a singular defect, that's a problem. That's a significant problem because it basically says that we have no idea uh, what we're doing. Now, all of these techniques can work, but the problem is that we should really narrow down to just one or two techniques. That What that tells us is that all of these techniques uh, have problems, because if they didn't have problems, it would be just one or two techniques. If I was gonna go to a heart surgeon or a brain surgeon, I would want to have that surgeon with a singular, with one di a single diagnosis, I wouldn't want him to present me with five or six or seven different options to treat that one diagnosis. I would want to hear that there's only one technique and it's been used for many years and it's very well documented. That's not the status of what we're at today in 2020 when it comes to bone augmentation and especially in the aesthetic zone. If we throw, throw in the topic of material selection on top of the techniques, it gets even more confusing. Uh, you have autogenous bone, you have bone substitute with, with all the different uh, available types that stirs a lot of controversies and discussions with people uh, advocating for uh, autogenous versus allograft versus xenograft. And then you have the alphabet soup of uh, growth factors, 
uh, platelet derived and all the different types of uh, available uh, enhancements that you can uh, use. So you can see how we do not have set protocols and everybody has their own little, every expert has their own little uh, concoction and they swear by it and they work and they go on the podium and, and every expert shows beautiful cases. So it's very, very convincing. The problem is that for us mortals who are sitting in the audience, we get confused because, and I'm sure that many of you go into meetings, uh, if there's 10 speakers, there's, there's 10 different ways to skin the same cat. Um, so uh, if we look to the literature to try to help clarify this confusion of multiple techniques over the last 20 years, there have been numerous systematic reviews published on the topic of vertical augmentation. I believe there were 17 um, up to, to 2020 in you know accepted and uh, respected journals. And I listed a few of those here for you uh, that you can see, and they all come to the same conclusion. The conclusion is essentially, we don't have enough data. We don't have enough long-term data, and we have no, no uh, data to compare, uh, or at least control studies that can give us good guidance. We have a lot of case reports, we have a lot of case series, but we have no data and we have no good comparative studies. In other words, how does uh, the use of uh, say the sausage technique compared to the use of say the quarry technique or the tit or titanium mesh or distraction, how does that compare and how much bone do you have? How much resorption do you get? We do have some data, but they're not real good data. And so, that's the conclusion. And so essentially what most people use when, they la when we're lacking data is they use uh, implant survival. So most folks, uh, most publications will say, well, you know, uh, you know so we, we have an augmentation, we gain uh, five millimeters, um, not a lot of data on resorption, uh, but we have really good implant survival. And so implant survival is often used as an outcome uh, after different types of bone augmentation procedures. So, so what I want to share with you is that implant survival after bone augmentation has never been shown to be affected by the intervention of bone augmentation, especially vertical augmentation. Let me repeat that. Bone augmentation may not necessarily improve implant survival. Now, I know some of you are probably listening thinking, what are you talking about? Well, I couldn't go to place an implant in this particular case that I had if I hadn't done bone augmentation. Maybe, maybe not. But if you look at the data from studies after studies after studies over the many decades, what you'll see, and I pulled out one uh, systematic review that was published in 2014, excuse me, um, and they looked at implant survival after, and in 68 publications after different types of bone augmentation procedures from GBR to block grafts to ridge split to distraction osteogenesis. And the, what they concluded was that the average implant survival that has been documented in these studies was between 96% to 9 to 100%. In other words, it doesn't matter what technique you do, if you stick an implant into the bone, even if it's only three millimeters left of that bone, it will integrate. And so it is not a good measure of success, yet it is often used to uh, justify bone augmentation. Chia Pasco in 2009 stated that in his uh, literature review that we have poor quality of data, but what he said was interesting is that we don't even know if some of these surgical procedures imp improve implant survival, which is what, what uh, I'm saying. Uh, it, it, it essentially, here's an example of a case that I saw in two, uh, 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 after uh, the patient had had bone augmentation 18 years ago. I didn't perform the bone augmentation. This a patient that had iliac crest bone graft to reconstruct the right posterior maxilla. And back 20 years ago, this was what was done. Um, and so, you know, you can see that when I saw her after 18 years, she had, all the bone had completely resorbed, but yet the implant still survived. And in fact, it survived on just the three to four millimeters of bone that was still there. Here's another case that uh, a, a, a prosthodontist referred to me. Um, where another surgeon had performed bone augmentation, and after 18 years uh, or so, uh, the implants still survive, the, and, uh, but yet there's uh, resorption. And in this, these particular cases, what's interesting is that uh, bone augmentation was done um, 
uh, especially in this case that on this side here, what you know the question I often ask is what if the patient had never had bone augmentation and just had shorter implants placed with longer restorations? And if you're going to use a little of bit, a little bit of pink, why not just extend the pink up into the area, use more pink, and just use shorter implants? Would that have achieved the same outcome? Most likely, most likely, especially in the aesthetic zone. If you do bone augmentation, especially in the aesthetic zone, and you end up having to use pink porcelain, I believe it's essentially an aesthetic, it's a failure in the bone augmentation procedure. Uh, again, the bone augmentation for vertical height may not necessarily improve implant survival. Um, and in the aesthetic zone, the use of pink porcelain after multiple, you know, of, after significant vertical augmentation procedures is essentially um, the, not the outcome that you wanted. Uh, for example, let's take a look at this case here. This pretend this case, this patient had an 18 millimeter vertical defect. And you did a you did a very successful augmentation. They had an 18 millimeter defect. You brought it down 15 millimeters. So you brought it down significantly, but you missed the th the last three millimeters. And if you have to use a little bit of pink, why not just maybe do less surgery, use more pink, use shorter implants. And so this is why. So again, if you have to use a little bit of pink, maybe use more pink and less graft. This is essentially why most systematic reviews and meta-analysis comparing vertical augmentation, vertical augmentation versus placing a short implant, all of them conclude that the use of short implants should be preferred to vertical augmentation. So here I am uh, you know, asked to speak on vertical augmentation, but what I'm telling you is that comparisons between the use of shorter implants and pink porcelain or prosthetic compensation versus vertical augmentation you're going to get a better outcome with shorter implants. Why? Because there's a significant amount of complications when you have to use vertical augmentation. And, and this is not the only, uh, there, there have been numerous studies. In fact, this particular study here in 2016 concluded that there was, that short implants had better outcome than vertical augmentation, but there, there is no evidence that augmentation had greater benefit for any outcome. Let me repeat that that vertical augmentation did not improve any outcome measures. So people often say, oh, well, you know, if you don't do vertical augmentation, you're gonna have a very uh, unfavorable crown to implant ratio. You have this horrendously long crown with very short implant. Again, these were all taken into account. And we know today that shorter implants are very successful comparing uh, when you compare it to uh, site. So, now, does that mean that we should not do vertical augmentation at all? That's not uh, the, the conclude. That's not the conclusion of what I'm saying because there are many patients where the, you 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 will have to do vertical augmentation. So, but if you do augmentation, your objective should not only be to uh, possibly improve implant survival, which we don't know uh, in in some of the cases whether they do, but you should try to improve aesthetic outcome. So, how do we do? when we look at the data on aesthetic outcome after vertical augmentation or even bone augmentation in general. So Cosin did a study and he compared four different modalities of treatment. One was essentially uh, conventional implants and immediate implants, not a lot of significant vertical uh, uh, bone augmentation. Now, on the other side, implants were placed after bone augmentation. So they were placed after GBR or after bone block augmentation. And so they looked at three different outcomes. The first outcome was implant survival. Uh, the second, so does uh, the addition of, ad, of doing augmentation, did that somehow affect or improve or, or decrease implant survival? What about complications? Does doing more surgery result in complication? And does doing more uh, grafting improve aesthetic? And so what did they find? Well, we already said implant survival, that, that most studies show that does not improve implant survival or affect implant survival whatsoever. Um, Plant survival. Complications, obviously, if you do more surgery, you're going to see more problems. You know, I'm Vietnamese and we have a saying if you go out a lot at night, you're going to see a ghost. And the same thing here if you're going to cut on the tissue, you're going to see a lot of blood. When you do a lot of surgery, you will see complications. That's expected. So, those two things are, are expected. Now, what about the aesthetic outcome? If you do bone augmentation, how, what kind of results can we expect? 
Well, what they found was that the, the least invasive procedures, meaning just extracting a tooth, putting an implant, had a, a pink aesthetic score about 11 out of 14. If you delay it, you, uh, you, you dropped about uh, a point to 10. Uh, and then with the, after GBR, the average outcome was about 9.6 out of 14. And after bone block, it was about 9 out of 14. Now, mind you, 8 is a complete aesthetic, complete failure. But I would tell you that 9 and 10 don't look very good either. Uh, so essentially, what, what I'm telling you is that the more surgery uh, that was done was associated with lesser aesthetic outcome. Now, some people may look at this data and say, well, Dr. Lee, you're comparing apples and oranges because the procedures that needed the augmentation had worse pre-existing condition they you know they came in with that's true you know I, and i may be comparing apples and oranges but you have to remember one thing all failures are failures of patient expectation that that this these procedures were not correlated with high aesthetic outcome in other words if you have four different patients come in and the patient that you choose to do augmentation on usually and this is basically reported by experts here uh, that their average score was between 9 and 9.65 after augmentation out of a possible 14. So all failures are failures of patient expectation. You must address that expectation. If you tell the patient, hey, I'm going to do this procedure because I'm going to give you this amazing result at the end, maybe you don't achieve it because the what the experts report is that the, their average score was lower than when if they did conventional implant placement. So keep that in mind. So. Why is that so? It's because of the, the difficulty of achieving the normal crest. All vertical augmentation procedures, the primary objective is to achieve a normal buccal crest. If you fail to achieve a normal buccal crest, then it's essentially you have to use pink porcelain. And so now there are three types of crest. There's the normal crest. There is the high crest, which is where you have a lot of bone, uh, like exostosis, thick, you know, very, you know, uh, good height. And then there's the low crest. Now, when you do bone augmentation, you not only want to achieve a normal crest, but you want to achieve a high crest. You want to, why? Because bone always resorbs. It doesn't matter what procedure, what technique you use, bone is a very dynamic uh, organ. And it, and especially in regenerative procedures, every procedure undergoes remodeling and a certain amount of resorption. And so, if you, uh, you you want a normal crest, you should go for a high crest to expect some resorption to achieve a normal crest. That's the difficulty. How do you get this high crest? Um, and the low crest, obviously, you do not want. So I see a lot of this, especially nowadays with social media. Uh, people have a lot of uh, the ability to showcase a lot of what they do on different types of platform. And so we see a lot, and this was just a case I pulled off of the internet that I saw that somebody was showing what an amazing outcome that they, that, that, or what, the, you know, the, uh, of grafting, of what the outcome uh, of out, uh, grafting was in this case. So this was a vertical defect that they had shown, the presenter showed. And again, I just borrowed this out of, I think, a Facebook post or Instagram post. And you can see there's a, there's a significant vertical defect here. And you can see that they had done titanium mesh with some autogenous bone. And they showed the post-operative CT scan showing a, a good height gain here. Um, and then they placed the implant, they put in some tissue, and they put some provisionals to groom the tough tissue, and then there's the final restoration. And so I look at that final outcome, and I thought to myself, you know, what, what was achieved here? What if we had not done any of these procedures and just placed two implants and did use the pink porcelain? There's plenty of bone width here. What was achieved? nothing the outcome was exactly the same so all these procedures was essentially to treat the doctor more than it is the patient so you have to keep this in mind that the buccal crest is important now how much so how much height do you, what is your goal so i said that the normal buccal crest well what is the aesthetic expectation that patients have on terms of crown length in other words you need to achieve a buccal crest what's the crown length well we know what normal teeth length should be right you know, for a central incisor, it's about 10.5. Uh, now, we know also from Vince Kosick's study that patient's perception of aesthetic is based, is greatly affected by the length of the teeth. What he did in this particular study is basically he lengthened the teeth and then he went and he asked patients and doctors what they perceived to be a failure. In other words, how long can a crown be before it was considered a complete failure to a patient? 
and to a doctor. And so he yes, he actually divided it in. So, so here in this case, you can see uh, you can pick out which one is the implant. It's obviously this one because it's a little bit longer there. Now, how long can this crown be before the patient perceives that as a as a failure that it, that they didn't accept that that where you have to use pink porcelain? Well, what he did is he asked three groups of people. He asked a general dentist, he asked orthodontist, and he asked lay people. And so he lengthened the crown. For, so for the general dentist, the answer was about 1.5. So for all of you listening that are like, and myself, we're all dentists. The margin is about 1.5. Our limit is about 1.5. Longer than that, if you make this, this, let's say you make this central two or three millimeters, it reaches the point of anesthetics, right? Orthodontist, a little, little more uh, picky. Why? Because they're dealing with symmetry. So, so they can see that probably a little bit better than that or more picky because of the, the symmetry that orthodontists deal with. Now with patients, it's about the same, 1.5 to 2. So their dental IQ when it comes to teeth length for vertical defects or, or augmentation is the same as us. So if we consider it not good looking, they're, gonna, they're the same. What's interesting is that when he did this with the papilla, he found a completely different outcome. And Vince Kosick basically did the same thing. He took these three groups and he shortened the pill, unilaterally shortened the papilla. And then he went back and he asked people, uh, patients and doctors, what they thought how many millimeters can you shorten a papilla on one side before it was considered anesthetic? Interesting what he found. Dentists were extremely picky. We will fight and kill each other over half a millimeter of papilla. Orthodontist, same thing. But with patients, what he found was that he, in his study, was that the patient couldn't discern the difference. They couldn't discern the difference if the white was, was there, the symmetrical white. Now, I'll go, I'm going to get back to this, and, and don't shoot the messenger. I'm just reporting this. I know some of you are listening. Oh, that can't be true. Well, this is, you know, uh, uh, has been shown in, in numerous studies, actually. So, so we know two things. Length is important, more important than uh, in terms of what patients see. Um, now, when we do vertical augmentation, sometimes you will have short papilla, but there are ways to overcome that. So we'll get back to this data uh, when we talk about augmentation. So how hard is it then to get the height of the bone, the normal crest? Your ability to uh, fix the normal crest depends on two things. The prognosis is on the number of walls around the defect and the length of the defect span. These two things are extremely important because they give you two things in terms of that buccal crest. They give you the stability of the buccal crest and they give you the osteogenic potential to be able to achieve that buccal crest. In other words, you are regenerating bone. You're asking the body to regenerate a missing part of their bone. There are two things that will give you that, uh, that osteogenic potential. What, that is the osteogenic potential of the site and the osteogenic potential of the patient. Some patients will make bone very easily, and there are patients that are very difficult to make bone. So I love it when I go to meetings and people, you know, show up case and say, oh, I can make bone. No, no problem. Uh, my friend showed me this case, text me this case and asked me if I can make bone in this huge vertical defect. Of course we can do that. And they, and I think to myself, that's impossible. How do you know you can make, how do you even know that patient has good osteogenic potentials? There are some little old ladies that have poor ability to make bone. And there are some people, you do the worst bone graft and they have bone growing out of their ears. Every protoplasm is different, dependent on so many factors, smoking, uh, diabetes, medications, lots of things affect osteogenic potential. But the, 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 site, the site is the number of walls and the defect span. Let's just give you an example. A high osteogenic potential site, you can spit in that site and it's going to make bone versus in the low osteogenic potential site, um, it's going to make bone very difficult. So the longer the span you create, the less osteogenic potential it is. In other words, so what I always say that it takes bone to make bone. Very similar to the analogy of the stock market. Or, or you need money to make more money. If you're investing, if you have money, it's easy to make money. But if you have very little money, it's harder to make a lot of money. And if you try to, it's very risky. Same thing with bone graft. If you have a lot of bone, easy to make bone. If you have little bone, it's much more risky. So you have to take, you have to alter your strategy. So let's take a look at this. And this is a high, this has multiple walls and a single span tooth. Very easy to make bone here. Very easy. We take away a wall, still pretty easy. Start to take away a lot of bone. 
you start to increase the span, all of a sudden the osteogenic potential decreases and the graft stability decreases. So um, this animal study shows that between a three millimeter width defect and the span of increased it by two millimeters to five millimeters, the vertical gain decreased significantly at three months. And a three millimeter defect at, after three months fills in 94% versus in a five millimeter defect, just increasing it by two millimeter drops to 75%. So the span decreases the osteogenic potential and the graph st uh, the st the stability of the crest. So, so when I look at this, so the title of my talk is uh, Vertical Augmentation, Myth versus Reality. One of the myths that I would like to dispel is that a lot of people say, oh, I have a vertical defect or I have a horizontal defect. It's a very simple diagnosis. And I told you at the beginning how one diagnosis can have so many different procedures. That's because our diagnosis is inadequate or is too black and white. As we all know, we don't live in a black and white world. We live in a gray world full of risk, full of uh, uh, colors. Bone defects are the same. They're not just horizontal defects and vertical defect. defects. Defects, I, I look at them based on those the, the factors that I just told you. So what I look at is how many walls are there and what's the span of the defect? Because I'd say that those two things give me my two most important prognostic indicator, which is osteogenic potential and uh, the graft stability. Now, we haven't talked about patient's osteogenic potential. We're just talking about site right now. So, and then of course, what's the amount of vertical defect, like how much I need to achieve. So then what vehicle I will use to achieve that. So then I base it on risk. Remember, we don't live in a black and white world. I don't, it's not a horizontal or vertical. It's basically how much risk and what type of osteogenic potential. And I classify these based on that. So low risk cases, fairly easy to make bone. High risk case like this, big span, one wall, very hard to make bone. Why? Because there's less osteogenic potential. But, you know, it's very, you know, what's the most common problem with this, trying to fix this type of defect? Essentially, it's wound dehiscence. Most authors that describe techniques to use this, almost every single author um, have problems. You know, they can do it, but they all report that their their most common complication is wound or soft tissue opening. Why? A lot of people say it's because the inexperience of the surgeon not being able to release the soft tissue to get primary closure. And I think, you know, that is not the reason. That That's really a reason if you're working with only inexperienced. Most people tackling this are not inexperienced surgeons. It is not the inability to release the soft tissue. It, and if it is, you should, you know, if you're a surgeon uh, that has experience doing this, you have and you cannot close the soft tissue, you have no business doing the, the grafting. It's very easy to close the soft tissue um, if, uh, to, to release it, in, in my uh, opinion. And, and if anybody has ex trouble cl closing this, very easy to do. And I, I spend five minutes and I can sh show you easily how to release that soft tissue. So soft tissue closure is not usually the problem. It's the low osteogenic potential of the site. Why does the wound open up? Well, with the proper use of biomaterial, you're essentially putting things that into a site that is not osteogenic. In other words, it's not uh, the, the, the the ability of the body to make bone in that site is challenged. So you are just putting this foreign material that is then seen by the body as a foreign body. What does the body do when it sees a foreign body? It spits it out. The wound opens up and invites the material to leave. So. And if you insist on closing it, you will get an infection. The infection is, again, the body's way, natural response to get rid of this foreign material. Versus when you put this into a wall defect with lots of bone, you can put anything in there. You can spit in it. You can leave it exposed. It's going to make bone and it's going to close. An extraction socket is highly osteogenic. When you pull a tooth, you have multiple walls and yet, and it's exposed to the mouth, every piece of food you eat that day, the next, you know, goes in there, you know, alcohol, you know, piece of fish, piece of pork goes in that hole, spit goes in there, but yet predictably after three months, you've got nice bone growing across that site. That's because it's highly osteogenic. And these sites that are less osteogenic is different. So I look at it based on risk. Now these two, I told you are fairly easy, Mult multiple wall, single teeth, two teeth defect. For these you can use, so again, in choosing your procedure, you must look at your 
osteogenic potential and graft stability. That's what makes the doctor the doctor. If not, we can train a monkey to do this. That's why you have the doctor's degree is the ability to differentiate which one, which sites have osteogenic potential and then how to address that, that topic of, of overcoming osteogenic potential. So sites like these, we use GBR, any type of material typically works. For two teeth defects, I use, still use GPR. I use a technique that I, uh, it's called, that I developed called the screw tent pole technique, or use a pontic. And then we'll talk about this uh, afterwards. So single teeth defect, i show you some examples. This patient needs to have no, this, the, the right, uh, left central incisor extracted. You can tell she's had an apicoectomy. She's a young, very attractive girl. She's about 23, 24 years old. Uh, she's undergoing orthodontic treatment. So this is interdisciplinary treatment. Uh, you can see the radial lucency she, where she's had the apicoectomy uh, clearly here on the CT scan. You can see where the root has been amputated, and you can see that the buccal plate is extremely thin. The soft tissue is also extremely thin. You you may not be able to see it on the scan, maybe on the, the but I can read to you the soft tissue is about 1.5 millimeters thick, so it's fairly thin. Uh, we usually want at least two to three millimeters of soft tissue around the implants to for the best aesthetic outcome. Uh, and then the buccal plate's thin. It's point, uh, I think, believe it's point eight or point seven. So it's thin. Then you have a uh, a, 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 cre a buccal crest that's unstable. So how do we address this? Well, when we if we don't address, if we just extract it, we have a a a, a, a low buccal crest, which is, and so this is fairly straightforward to fix using traditional. Much it's a wall defect. It's highly osteogenic because it's a single teeth defect. I just have to be able to get my graft stability at the buccal crest. So the way I like to do this, and this is different than maybe some uh, other folks' uh, the, uh, technique, is I use a site-specific vertical incision. I call this the open book incision. I've been using this technique for about uh, you know maybe 18 years. Uh, I've published a lot uh, on the on this technique, and maybe and some people uh, uh, don't like the. Uh, that we make a vertical incision at the site, it violates many surgical principles. One of the main surgical principles, you're putting an incision right where you're putting graft. And so this is different than uh, other types of graft. I, I, I believe there's no perfect incision. And uh, my objective is to get the bone to stay at the crest. I believe that when you make a vertical incision and you make a distant vertical incision, what happens is now you have a much more significant reflection of the flap. And now you put your biomaterial, which is basically like a bunch of sand, it's going to migrate away from the buccal crest. Remember what I told you earlier, if you fail to correct the buccal crest, your graft is a failure. So, so you must keep the bone at the buccal crest. So this incision design, I call the open book incision, site-specific vertical, and do not, uh, we uh, just make a slight reflection and tunnel into this area. When we put graft, the graft stays at the buccal crest. It's like a, a pouch of rocks. So here it is, we put, uh, and we use a biomaterial here. We use an, a mineralized allograft with a collagen membrane, and we just uh, close that. We leave the area here exposed. Remember I said about osteogenic potential? This is a highly osteogenic potential site. It, can be left exposed because it's going to make bones just like an extraction socket. Now, if you were doing a low osteogenic potential site and you left it exposed, you're going to have a problem. So why do we leave it exposed? Because we want to encourage healing by secondary intention. What is going to fill in here? It's going to fill in whatever cells surround this area, which is keratinized tissue. So this is our technique to improve keratinized tissue width. So you can see after four months, we have much better keratinized tissue. There is evidence to show this works. And we have done studies on this also, uh, that we are in the midst of public, uh, publishing. We are doing, we had done a control, randomized control split mouth study, looking at exposed healing versus primary closure. And we have found uh, with biomaterial for single teeth site, uh, the outcome is essentially the same, except that you actually get better keratinized tissue with. And this has also been uh, shown by Barone in 2014. Now, the second thing that we see is this. Now, you notice how when we close this at the normal crest, but yet after four months, I have a high crest. How did this happen? After four months, how did I go from here to here? I have too much bone. I have too much tissue. It comes down to two things. It's graft stability 
Remember I told you we want, this is an easy problem to fix. You want a lot of bone. So you want graphs, it's essentially the incision design, localizing the graft into the site so that gravity pulls it down over time. And essentially I now have a high press. It's incision design that allow me to easily achieve this in a single teeth defect. And, and, not, and, then, and then filling it with just the right amount of graft material and the exposed healing. So there's the site. Now this is fairly straightforward to do. We can place the implant flapless, 90, 80, 80 to 85% to, and sometimes upwards of 90% of implants that we place in our practice after augmentation is done flapless. Two indications for flapless surgery, adequate band of keratinized tissue, and adequate width of bone. Uh, and so here we have plenty of, you know, we have 10, over 10, we have 10 millimeters uh, of, of bone uh, or 11 millimeters. We placing a 3.8 millimeter implant, fairly straightforward to do. You can close your eyes and place this flapless. And so we place it, uh, and now we have too much soft tissue, very easy to fix. You can see we have more keratinized tissue now or on this side than we did on the natural tooth because of the intervention that I recommended. So now this is a very easy problem to fix. We send this over to our prosthodontist, Dr. Uh, Gianmarco O'Brien, and he essentially uses the, a screw retained provisional to essentially push the soft tissue, displace the soft tissue apically. And how much you displace it depends on how much bone you have. And this is a CT scan. After it's restored, you can see the amount of bone that we've created. Again, we have made it a normal crest. And now look at the soft tissue thickness. Remember before, I showed you the soft tissue thickness was 1.5 millimeters. Now the soft tissue thickness is 3.5 millimeters. How did the soft tissue thicken when I did no soft tissue intervention? We didn't do any, we didn't put a connective tissue graft there. Essentially, it comes down to making this bone thick. The thicker you, the crestal bone you can keep at the crest, the thicker the soft tissue is. We have published this correlation and we were the first group to show this that thick bone buckle bone crustal bone around implants is always correlated with thick buckle soft tissue and you um and so here's the final outcome the orthodontics is complete the band of keratinized tissue you can see um here and again credit to uh the pro uh, my uh, uh, our, our, pro our colleague prosthodontist dr o'brien and naoki hayashi on the on the beautiful work. you can see the before and you can see the after straightforward case this is not a difficult case as i told you single teeth out but i'm just showing an example so now for multiple teeth defect we would do the same thing if we're going to augment we have to augment the buccal crest here's an another example you can see very thin bone this is like a potato chip it's about one millimeter of thickness of bone and you can see that uh through the site the patient is missing is going to have implants uh, across this area uh six to eleven you can see how thin this bone is. Now, my augmentation goal is to fix the buccal crest. And so I used it, the, 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 a technique that we've been uh, doing for many, many years, now almost uh, upwards to, to 20 years, the screw tent pole technique. We, uh, we uh, call it the screw, uh, the tent pole, because the screw is acting as a tent pole. And uh, after Bob Mark's technique of using implants as a tent pole, around the same time, we published, uh, we started using tenting screws instead of implants. And so you see how we angle the screw towards the buccal crest. Remember, there is no point for me to do an augmentation and have the bone go all the way up to the apex. There's plenty of bone up here. If I wanted to know, do this with a graftless protocol, I just shave this piece of bone down and place the implant right here. Remember, bone augmentation does not necessarily improve implant survival. There's plenty of bone to place implants here. I could easily place implants with no grafting here and just use pink porcelain. But we don't want to do that. This is the wife of a dentist, and she, did, she wants a nice aesthetic outcome with no pink. So I use the screw tent pole. I fix the buckle crest, and I close it. And, you, and I want to sh also show you before the, the preoperative, and you, I want to... Uh, show you the the, the, the the keratinized width. You see the uneven asymmetric keratinized band here. Over here it's very thick, over here it's very thin. That's because of the shrinkage of the bone causing shrinkage of the keratinized tissue. And so by screw by using the graft, we can actually alter soft tissue parameter. Again, repeat that. Bone, underlying bone can affect soft tissue parameters around implants. This is 
a very foreign topic. I know for some of you listening, you're probably thinking, what is this guy talking about? You know, what does an oral surgeon know about soft tissue? So I just want to show you, you know, in the last case, I showed you how we can alter the thickness of soft tissue without uh, soft tissue grafting. Here, I want to show you how we can alter keratinized band by stretching the keratinized tissue. So here we are placing, uh, and again, you know, you can read these articles on wh why we use the tensing screw and what their protocol is. Uh, so you can see afterwards where, where our augmentation is, this buccal crest is corrected. You can see the keratinized band. We place the implant through our flapless protocol. Again, as I told you, when we have adequate bone, adequate keratinized tissue, the implant is placed flapless. Our provisional restoration is then used to groom the soft tissue. You can start to see the keratinized tissue here. It's very even now, whereas before it wasn't. And there, Naoki makes our final restoration. Here's our uh, delivery. These are pictures that uh, Naoki took, took. Now you can see the band of keratinized tissue where it's uneven before. How is it that now it is fairly symmetrical and even? And there's the before. You can see there's the after. And you can see the, 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 the soft tissue can be altered. So let's get into the vertical defects. I just wanted to, to, to set the foundation of, 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 uh, of what our goals are when we do augmentation. So uh, based on our prognostic indicator of uh, osteogenic potential of the defect length walls and what our goal is in achieving aesthetic outcome. We wanna achieve a normal or high crest. So if we are dealing with severe vertical defects, what procedure selection should we choose? Well, it goes back to the same foundation. We must be able to correct the crest so that uh, if not, just place a few short implants and use a lot of pink. Save the patient the trouble of an augmentation. Second thing, is we, uh, we must look at, so what procedure do we choose to correct that buccal crest? And what is that procedure based on? Remember what we said, osteogenic potential. And what does osteogenic potential depend on? Number of walls and span of defect. Now, this is where the second myth uh, in reality comes in. When I show a defect like this, and we've presented many, many, many meetings, specialty meetings, lots of highly specialized, very well-trained people. And if I were to show a defect such as this, uh, and I ask, you know, five different surgeons on how they would fix this defect, I would bet I would get about eight different opinions, 10 different opinions, and they will all fight about it. And they always swear that, that their technique is the best way and there's no other technique. I believe that this is a myth that I believe that there really is no, the reality of this is that there is no procedure of any of these that I showed you that can fix this so that you don't have to use pink. It, these techniques are only vehicles to get you to a normal crest. The ability not to use pink relies on unspoken sweat and blood, time consuming procedures that you uh, or your prosthodontist or restorative dentist are doing behind the scenes. That's the ability. So that is a myth that there's somehow, so people always ask me, you know, what procedure are you going to use to treat that? I have never found a single procedure that can correct this without uh, uh, adjunctive procedures. In other words, these are just small little vehicles to get there, to get close to it. Then you have to use adjunctive procedures to achieve the final outcome. So that's a myth. The reality is not why. So why is there so many procedures? And I said earlier, they, all these procedures work. The problem is that they all have problems. Every five years, and uh, what I've noticed is that a new guru comes along, a new expert, a new, you know, from the podium or somewhere in the world, and, 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 and they will show you something and everybody will be amazed and then everybody will want to, and then they will have a course for you to take. And I've noticed either five, eight years, not longer than that. There's always something or, or, or a company will come out with something. And if you talk to people that, you know, I've been practicing now for a little over 20 years. And one thing that I've just started to realize about 10 years ago is that if you practice long enough, you're going to see everything go in a full circle. In other words, we started with autogenous bone. People started saying, oh, that's too, so many problems with autogenous bone. We started to go to biomaterial. And then we said, oh, you know, and then we started to see problems and we started to go to growth factors. And it's also now, you notice a lot of people are now going back to autogenous bone. We're still starting right back to where we started. You find this with a lot of different things. 
and, and the reason why everything goes in a full circle is that essentially we try new things we see problems we run from that problem with a new technique when we think that that technique and we try for five ten years then we find that we see the long-term problems and then we get away from that this is the reason why you, you know 10 years ago distraction was so popular then you had osteotomy you, this titanium mesh was so popular and then block graft before was popular now and then it went away and now it's quarry plates and then gbr and now sausage and, they, and i can guarantee you we're going to see this circle repeat itself why because there are a lot of problems there are many 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 problems augmentations vertical augmentation is fraught with problems and if anybody tells you that they have no problems that they they that they have magical results they are probably selling you some kits and some courses and some company is probably paying them a lot of money to do that don't believe that especially for the younger surgeons who are listening that the majority of techniques for vertical augmentation today have significant problems one of the most common problems as i told you is wound dehiscence and resorption you have early problems and you have late problems you have lack of keratinized tissue and you have poor aesthetic and so resorption complications all of that is dependent on the amount of vertical defect the more you try to gain the higher the problem remember i told you about the stock market analogy if you're trying to go for a volatile stock that has potential to gain a lot of money it also has a lot of potential to lose you a lot of money you try to jump off of a roof you probably have maybe a higher chance to break your leg versus if you jump little baby steps down the roof through or climb down same thing with augmentation here we find that with gbr you can gain about four millimeters with vertical but your and your complication is lower with the block graph you gain a little bit more you start to get higher complication with distraction you get a lot more but you get a lot more complication so you know it's like orthognathic surgery the more bigger movements we make the more resorption and the more relapse we get the bigger the jump the bigger the problem so keep that in mind there is no magical procedure this is human biology so Resorption is very common with every procedure. Early on in 2002, almost 18 years ago, uh, they reported that you get about you lose about 42% of original volume after a block graft, 2.2 millimeters. This and a lot of people disputed that because the the measurement was used done using a perio probe. But I still say that you know you get a significant amount of resorption based on where the defect is uh, with with uh, with every technique. This was a systematic review and meta analysis looking at only horizontal augmentation not vertical remember i we all know horizontal augmentation is rather straightforward and easy to do so with horizontal augmentation what they found between block and gpr the average resorption if you you gain about three the average gain is about 3.7 millimeters so right when you do it they measured it they said that you gain about 3.7 and that you resorb and this is only after six months not a year or a year and a half or five years or ten years Keep in mind, six months is meaningless. Bone resorption occurs, is very dynamic, can occur over many, many years. But only at six months, what they found is that you start with 3.7, you lose one on average 1.2, and you end up with 2.8. You're losing almost a third of that. This is with just lateral. What do you think the outcome is going to be with vertical augmentation? Well, we don't have that data because we don't have the same type of a comparison at this point. So the conclusion was that regardless of material, resorption should be expected, but should we throw out the baby with the bathwater? No, you, you can still use it. It's just that you have to prepare for it, overcorrect uh, defects. And that what did they find? Actually, the block graph had the better outcome, less resorption. Why? Because it has the ability to correct the buccal crest and, uh, or better graft stability than the biomaterial, because the biomaterial tends to, to migrate. So, the distraction the more gain the more loss and this this study showed that you with distraction you can gain about 6.4 millimeters but that's after you lose about 21 percent of the original volume but if you follow this for four years they found that you lose another three millimeters you lose half the volume so there is the more you gain the more you lose and so then this is long term here's a case we did we distracted down by the time we took the distract you can see already some relapse and i told you that's why a lot of problems things going full circle go for the simple solution so if you have to do augmentation what i always tell patients there are patients i'm going to show you where we have to do augmentation 
what we need to do is we need to, all failures are failures of patient expectation. I always tell patients that it is fraught with complications. It is two steps forward and one step back. In other words, you know, on a podium, this is what my cases look like. But in reality, for it to look like that, the road often looks very scraggly. A lot of, a lot of sweat and a lot of blood and a lot of heartaches, a lot of, and I would say that a lot of these cases we end up doing, we make no money because we are doing a, a lot of retreat. Uh, so how do we avoid that? Remember I told you that the stock market, the more volatile, the riskier, well, how does somebody avoid losing all their money? You, you, t you do risk mitigation. You, uh, you, you stage it. So in other words, instead of jumping off the roof, you maybe, or you take, uh, you, you take little baby jumps. So I stage everything. I stage my augmentation. If I need to extract these, I stage the extraction. I use a pontic a lot. And then when I do restorative treatment, I always, uh, the restorative plan always includes four to six front teeth and then, uh, and then a, a vestibuloplasty afterwards. So why do we stage? Well, um, a lot of times when you have a defect like this here that looks like it's just a vertical defect, when you augment, a lot of times you may gain width, but if you lose the crest, all of a sudden you have a short a vertical defect. So by staging it, you can build some width and then you can define where your vertical height is going to be, then come back and correct the vertical height. Here's an example. This is a, ver a horizontal defect. You can see where the, the line here is. You have plenty of soft tissue height. It's a thin wall. You go in and you do augmentation. This is a case we did about 20 years ago. We were using the tenting screw augmentation. We came back. We got the width, but if you notice here, we lost the height. Why? Because the bone was thin, and we, and here we had about four or five millimeters. Now we have about two millimeters. So we ended up with a vertical defect. Now, had we staged this, we would know, and our all failures are failures of expectation. I would know that okay, I'm going to do this. Then I'm going to correct the the vertical. Uh, defect and then use a pontic the pontic always gives me better free vertical height and so so here's an example of a pontic site some of you may have seen this this was a case we did about 18 years ago i placed these implants over 20 years ago on this patient and he came back and he had recession loss of keratinized tissue and loss of buccal bone recession long tooth and the way that we fixed this was we removed the middle implant to correct the height and create a pontic, use a tent, screw tent pole technique and, and to fix the, the bone and some dehiscence. And you can see we were able to correct the height by allowing an exposed healing. Keratinized tissue formed over the exposed area by repositioning some of these keratinized keratinocytes around the site. You can see the, the exposed there. You can see using the same implants, we were able to correct this and improve soft tissue parameters by improving the bone around the implant. So you can see we were able to gain height and we were able to gain uh, improved soft tissue height uh, parameter. So let's go back to these here. We told you already, uh, defect diagnosis determines procedure. Procedure is dependent on diagnosis. So, and, and it's, and it's uh, I, I based on the scale. So for single teeth, multiple teeth, we use, as I showed you, we look at osteogenic potential. For these, I use GBR, G, screw temple. For these, based on osteogenic potential, I like to use procedures that have high osteogenic potential. I don't like to use GBR for these defects. I know that there are many people that are using that. For example, the It's Von Urban with the sausage technique, uh, with uh, GBR, you know, with uh, uh, dense PTFE. I believe that, yes, those techniques work great, but they also have a lot of uh, complications associated with them because the, the, it does not address the, the, the topic of osteogenic potential. So let's, I'll and, I'll, and I'll share it with you some cases. I'm gonna share with you a couple of cases and, and, the, 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 and we'll call it a, a, a day with the lecture. So here we'll start with a single vertical but very significant vertical defect with a loss of attachment to the adjacent tooth, um, a patient with a very high smile line. And this patient actually had a procedure done that had failed, an augmentation procedure done uh, by a colleague of mine and the graph had failed and resulted in loss of attachment to the right, the left central, very, very significant vertical defect, lots of soft tissue. The problem is he has a high smile line, he's about 32 years old, and he will not accept pink porcelain in this area. So the case uh, has some challenges. The biggest challenge, uh, remember the, of the two things, the most important goal here is achieve the height. Remember I told you Vince Kosick study, patients know height, maybe the papilla, 
you can camouflage. So how do we address this? We have to use, again, some camouflage here. Height patients know, and we know that teeth length are about 10.5 millimeters for central incisors, and this is quite short. So I can cheat by gaining it by doing a little crown lengthening over here. I can bring this down. Remember I told you single teeth defects using the incision design that I advocated for you. It's very easy to correct this height. Very easy to bring this down with, a, with the incision design. The papilla, I'm going to leave it alone because it's very difficult to aug for now. So how are we gonna do this? We're gonna balance the height. And I told you we're gonna do some crown lengthening over here. We're going to do our open book incision. So we leave the papilla alone. Don't even touch it. Just make a vertical site, single site. Localize our graph so that when, and allow gravity and time and, and localize the graph so that we can at least achieve some graph stability. Remember, we, we're trying to gain the height here. Remember the same like the principle that I showed you in the first case. And so that's how we close it. And that there is our height. Same papilla has not changed. Now, and during this time, the patient has a provisional that does not touch the soft tissue. Remember, it was, it was up here. And you see how by allowing time after four months, now it doesn't look so bad. The papilla is still short. So we place the implant. Remember I told you the protocol, a lot of bone, tissue, keratinized tissue, tissue is acceptable. We place the implant flapless. Then we just trim the tissue a little bit more to balance out the gingival height. We trim it all across, and we we add a second provisional just uh, or uh, to the implant. And so you can see we were able to go from here to here with doing very little. The papilla is still short; it doesn't look so bad now because we are filling with white. Maybe Vince Kosick is correct. Now I send this to my prosthodontist, uh, Dr. O'Brien. And he's gonna do a little bit of fine tuning of this little papilla using another set of provisional. Remember I told you getting the height is just part of the, so it's only 50% of, uh, of the treatment. It's the unspoken detail, the blood and sweat that behind the scenes that allows you not to use pink porcelain. And so how do we, so we have a short papilla here. So what he's gonna do is we're gonna use uh, he's going to under contour the initial provisional to uh, during the healing during the first six months to allow the soft tissue to bulk into the area to fill into this site after this uh, soft tissue fills into this site then we're going to add bulk subgingivally to push the soft tissue into this little space here so during the this is extremely important the first four to six months during scar contraction and reorganization of collagen you have to leave the tissue alone under contour. Then after it's filled in, then you over contour just to uh, push it out. And so this is what Dr. Uh, O'Brien, he draws a line where it is, and then he adds a uh, composite. There you can see the subgingival adding of a flowable composite, the bulk underneath the soft tissue right there to uh, push the soft tissue. And you can see that he's able to push it just a, a little bit in. And we, then he trims a little bit more there, the gingivectomy. And again, these are just little, little fine tuning. And there's a the little bulk you can see in the soft, in the underlying uh, uh, of developing the soft tissue. This is mimicked in the in the uh, abutment. This bulk, and we send again to Naoki. And this is now uh, hard to believe, but it's. Uh, you know, we started this treatment for this patient in 2014, and I just saw the patient back uh, just last week and uh, took uh, these photos. And you can see, very uh, presentable. The papilla is still short. The papilla is not corrected. This is still short if you look at it, but the patient is very, very, very uh, accepting uh, of the result. So, now we're gonna to get to some, you know, about another five minutes of some uh, difficult uh, defects here. Um, now, remember I told you when there's wall defect, very easy to, to, to fix the graft stability and the um, osteogenic potential. Like here, you have significant vertical soft tissue defect, no keratinized tissue, but because it's wall, we're able to put, you know, using the same incision design, the open book incision, there's a short papilla right here too. You see the short papilla here, 
So we just use the same incision design, stretch out the keratinized band with the graft. You have to put the right amount, that's the trick, to stretch this keratinized band. Then we place the implant flapless, and then the crown's placed. This uh, is now uh, 16 years result. Um, and so now when the defect is not walled, so that was a wall defect. This is a non-wall defect. This gal uh, was ejected from a car, broke her jaw. You can see there's a fracture and you can see there's a class three mild occlusion and a normal occlusion here. And so the way, when we're, there are no walls, well, we're going to use the screws. So some people ask me, when do I use the screws and when, why I didn't use the screw in the previous case? Here, you can see how thin the bone is. You can see the fracture. This is where we use the screw to gain the buccal crest. So we're going to stage this. I told you we stage it. The plan here is to gain this height. We have about five millimeters of height I need to gain. I need to correct this class, uh, one, uh, class three occlusion. So I'm going to uh, extract this tooth and create a pontic. Remember the pontic concept? But I'm not gonna do it now. I'm gonna stage it. I'm gonna do a horizontal augmentation first, correct the crest, then come back, extract this tooth, create a pontic, then, uh, so this is the, the what, so here we do the first graph to correct the height. Then now that we have bone, remember we talked about the stock market. When you have a lot of money, you have a lot of bone, now you can take a little more risk. Now I have bone, now I take this tooth out. I don't take it out initially. Remember I told you that the span of the defect dictates the osteogenic potential of the site. If I had extracted this tooth by uh, originally, in the first surgery, now I have a long span with low osteogenic potential and a much more significant vertical defect. Remember, the stock market analogy, I have little money here. I need to make money first before I do a, a risky procedure. So I make the money, now I extract the tooth, I place one implant, I, augment, I create the pont, I do the pontic site development using the screw tent pole. Once that's healed, then I place my second implant, flapless. And now I have my Pontic, there's the screw, same as before. I have Giuseppe, my Romeo, uh, doing the healing period, the same concept. Let gravity play into this because I've localized my graph with my incision design, the open book incision. I allow gravity to fill into that. And there's the day of the provisional insertion, and you can see four months later, Pontic site development with tensing screw. Now you can see I achieve from this to this, doing very low risk, little baby jumps. I didn't jump off the roof, I did little baby jumps and I had very low risk procedures to achieve this height. I still have a slight vertical, I mean, uh, collapse of the soft tissue, the way that I correct that. Some people, now if I were ask uh, some of the uh, folks on how they would fix this collapse of soft tissue, I know that there are many ways to do this. Some people do soft tissue grafts and people, remember I staged this because I wanted the soft tissue to come down with the pontic. If I had, if now if I go and I cut this cyst tissue open, I'm gonna create shrinkage again. So yes, I can do tunneling, but I'm gonna show you another technique that I use to how to address this. I place a third implant. I want good contour. You see this collapse? I place a third implant to correct that. And I push the tissue out with my provisional. And you see the before, how it's collapsed, the soft tissue, and yet afterwards, the soft tissue is pushed buccally. And notice how thick the soft tissue is in all these cases. So far, every single case I've shown you, uh, we haven't had to add any connective tissue at this point. And we, yet we have two to three millimeters of soft tissue thickness in every single case. That's because we corrected the buccal crest. There's the emergence profile. You can see the tensing screw still there. I see the keratinized band. We correct the class the three occlusion. And you can see, and this was done with uh, Sam Malawi in Beverly Hills Dental Laboratory and Dr. Brian Novak. There's our CT scan, and you can appreciate how thick the soft tissue is. The soft tissue in these cases is uh, four millimeters, three, three millimeters, 2.9, and three millimeters. So very thick soft tissue in every single bit because we have very thick bone. So lastly, let's get to the, the, the severe defects, the more, you know, and I told you the really severe ones. And some of these will not accept pink porcelain. And this patient had plenty of, she had failing implants that needed to be removed. There's no keratinized tissue around these implants. 
Um, and she's a very, a very high smile line. This is not a patient that will accept pink porcelain. And so, you know, I, I always offer the patient short implants, pink porcelain. But so these are the techniques that we have available. We can use GBR, traditional GBR that's advocated by many people. Uh, or as I told you earlier, I like to use an osteotomy or distraction osteogenesis. Um, now, GBR, I told you one of the main problems is wound dehiscence. Why? Because low osteogenic potential, one wall, multiple, big span. I like to use an osteotomy. Osteotomies are highly osteogenic. It's a fracture and it heals by fracture. And so these are, uh, you know, titanium mesh or, or GBR. Every author that I've seen publish large series on these report between you know, as little as 14% up to 52%. These are all like, you know, very well-known people, Bob Marks and other, and, and, and even non-mesh, uh, like non-resorbable membrane report is that uh, large studies show about 20% resorption. Now I know that there are papers uh, by authors that report zero dehiscence and, and, and they are in the rarity. And I would say that all failures are failures of patient expectation. I would not go into a surgery, into a battle uh, making that claim with my patient. I show you here a case we, uh, and this is one paper that I, uh, the thought such technique that's popularized uh, by, by Dr. Urban here. You can see he reported 21 cases of vertical augmentation growing over five millimeters of vertical height with zero dehiscence, and every single case was a success. Now, this may work with Dr. Ur in Urban's, uh, Dr. Urban's hand, but I would say that for most of you, or, or me, or us mortals, I would be extremely hesitant to accept that you will not have a problem because I this is not the result that that I have seen reported by many of my colleagues. They do report that you know, unfortunately, the reason is because we don't work on Superman. We don't have excellent protoplasm in every single patient. Some patients smoke a little, a little. Some people smoke, they, maybe they smoke a little pot. Maybe they're a little obese. Maybe they're a little unhealthy. They got a little di pre-diabetic. You don't have perfect patients and you don't have perfect osteogenic potential. We live in not in a black and white world. We live in a gray world. So in this particular case, what I did is I, I actually treated this using a GBR technique. I'm going to do this by split mouth one side, I'm going to use a collagen membrane. On the other side, I'm going to use a sausage technique. So here's the dense PTFE. You can see on this side, just a collagen membrane. Now, the reason why I bring this case up is just I just want to show you. Now, I, I think that vertical defects are extremely difficult. And I think that that should only be done by experienced clinicians, such as, say, Dr. Urban and, 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 and folks that have experience and that have uh, uh, the, the experience to deal with the complications because the complications from these can be severe. Now, um, you can see here, I, I just want to compare with you because I, I, I think that uh, there's there's misleading information out there that, you know, that somehow this uh, is going to be, you know, that there's no problems with this. I just want to show you on this particular case, the only difference in the intervention, I use the exact same protocol except for one thing and on a split mouth study in the same patient the sausage on one side and collagen on the other using dense ptfe and on this side collagen membrane resorbable collagen membrane close it tension free but yet three weeks later only one side gets exposed why is it that only one side gets exposed and it's it's and again it's because when the body you know we tack it down foreign body reaction is very real and so it gets infected. This is other studies reporting on, this was one study that reported on my technique, the screw tent pole technique. So the effectiveness of screw tent pole compared to the sausage technique. So they compared, this was a very recent study and they compared it to the tunnel technique. Now this was done by the chairman of uh, George Deep of uh, Virginia Commonwealth Oral Maxwell Facial Surgery. And so these are done by, by people with quite a lot of experience. And he reported that he had 50% exposure using this technique with dense PTFE versus using a collagen, the only 11% exposure. So, you know, it, it's not 0%, it's not 0%. So now why do I bring that up? I bring that up because it has to do with osteogenic potential. How do I treat this defect? I use an osteotomy. Studies have shown that the difference between them, the osteotomy is where you make a cut up in the vestibule 
you fracture the bone and you push it down, creating a enclosed wall defect. Remember what I said about wall, the number of walls. I'm creating wall defect of native bone. So essentially this heals like a fracture. Now, how long do you think this takes to heal? How long does a fracture heal? Most mandible fractures, we wait six weeks. So when I fracture this, I wait six to eight weeks, this heals. Now versus traditional GBR, sausage, whatever. How long do you, do you wait? 10 months, 12 months, eight months, completely different. But the difference is there is zero exposure with this technique because it's highly osteogenic. So this was a randomized control study of 16 patients, eight on each side, one using titanium mesh with xenograft and allograft, uh, or an autogenous bone. The other side, they treated with an osteotomy. What they found was the, a little bit better gain with the osteotomy. The only difference was there is zero exposure versus uh, with uh, this, they reported 20% exposure. So there is zero exposure when you do this because it's contained. So this case that I showed you, I had this exposure. How did I treat this? Well, this is exposures because this material is a foreign body to the patient versus the collagen wasn't uh, in this particular patient. So how do I treat that? I just basically did an osteotomy. I fractured it, I brought it down, and then basically came back, placed implant. And you can see I had an exposure using GBR, but had zero exposure. I was able to bring the soft tissue uh, down. And we have published on this. Uh, oh, excuse me, we have submitted for publication and it's been resubmitted after revision. And uh, we presented this at the AO two years ago. And what we found was that this was not a technique for every procedure. Remember, we don't live in a black and white world. This procedure, what you, when you use this technique, uh, what we found was when we delineated this based on the length of the span, we found that, that GBR. Big span was high risk. Remember I told you, low osteogenic. But in osteotomy, big span is biggest gain. So in one, two teeth segment, three teeth segment, four teeth segment, five teeth segment. The more teeth that are missing or the bigger the piece of bone, the better the gain uh, after 12 months, uh, after uh, 377 days. In other words, the bigger the gain, the, the, the segment, the bigger the gain. In other words, so for defects that are big like this, you want to use an osteotomy, not GBR, because again, again, not the black and white world that we are led to believe. So let's go back and look at this. Now, only criteria for doing this is that you have to have adequate bone width and height. So you have to have enough width, uh, uh, greater than 10 millimeters, and at least 10 millimeters of height. So let's just review here. For one to two millimeters, I use a screw tent pole with multiple teeth defect. Three to five millimeters, I use an osteotomy. I bring it down about seven millimeters, six to seven, five to seven. That's about the maximum you can bring it. And then some resorption will occur and you get about five. If it's greater than five, then I use distraction or I do two osteotomy. So let's take a look at this case. So there's, there's four stages to this. The first thing is that, remember the criteria is you have to have at least 10 millimeters of width and 10 millimeters of height. If you don't have that, you have to do initial GBR to get that first. Remember, you need money. The more money you have, the lower the risk. You don't want to do a procedure with little money, or you don't want to invest when you have little money. It's the same analogy. Build the money, build the bone. Then you go in, you place it. So the first thing I do, this patient had thin bone, we augment using simple width GBR. So by gaining the width, we went from, we got this width now. There, there's before, and now we got about 12, 13 millimeters of bone. So we got a lot of money now. Now we make the bony cut. Osteotomy, what do we put in here? We put some mineralized allograft. And you can see the before and the after. There's an after, then we place our implant. Now here we did not do it flapless because there is no not enough keratinized tissue. And also, we needed to make more uh, build bone on top of that using the pontic site development protocol. So we're combining techniques now. We're using tenting sc screw tent pole with pontic site development. There's a screw. You can see how we screw it, tent it out. There's our height. And now you see. So what did we do so far? First stage was build the money, make the money, then uh, bring it down. Then place the implant with uh, pontic. 
Now, often the fourth is always a vestibular plasty. When you do a significant vertical defect, a 10, 15 millimeter vertical defect, you're often always going to end up bringing lip tissue, mucosa, uh, into the, 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 the site. So you have to do what's called a vestibular plasty with a free gingival graft. So you have to basically push that tissue back up into a tight to create vestibule, free gingival graft, and put pon uh, pontic to develop the soft tissue. And then here's the before, this is after. It's 2017. I wanted to go back in and dermabraid that, but the patient didn't want to. Um, and that's basically the result. Here's another case. Um, we have uh, infected implants, no keratinized tissue, you can see. Infection, very poor protoplasm because the site's severely infected. So same thing, four stages. Remember, we've got to make the money first. There's very little money up here. Don't do the, uh, so we have to do, so we do the graft first. And so you can see there's no keratinized tissue, very bad protoplasm, very bad osteogenic, long span, very, a lot of scar tissue, not good for osteogenic potential. This is not a case I would like to do GBR on. It can work. Problem is, I'd rather do something that is better osteogenic potential. So what I'm gonna do is build the width first. There's with the implants in, you see the width? This is after building the money. Here I make my money, so I make lots of width, bone. Now I go back in. In this particular case, uh, I did distraction, but I easily could have done os an osteotomy. The reason why I did distraction here is that the defect was actually about 10 to 12 millimeters, so I distracted it down. We distracted it down. We overcorrect in anticipated resorption. Remember I told you earlier that there's a lot of resorption. So do we throw out the baby with the bath water? No, we basically overcorrect by about five millimeters. So here's before, afterwards, and there's the overcorrection. You see the overcorrection, a little bit of a non-union. Then we um, come back, we place our implants, our third phase, screw tent pole technique, vestibuloplasty, basically push the vestibule up, put provisional to allow soft tissue to come in, just uh, as before. And then final restoration, and this is four or five years later. You see the soft tissue starts to come in, and the healing of the soft tissue. And then lastly, uh, it's very similar, same thing, combination of uh, significant vertical defect. These are for all from implant failures. The patient had implant failure, um, had multiple procedures already done. Very, you can see the original height and width. So now see, this only has eight millimeters and eight millimeters. So I don't have my prerequisite. I don't have a lot of money. So I do my initial GBR. So there's my before. So there's my, with provisional, you can see the defect. It's actually, the bone is up here. It's much worse. There's a lot of soft tissue here. So it's a defect that's actually a lot worse than it uh, shows. You can see the amount of residual bone there. So we build the width. We're not trying for vertical now, although it can work, but we don't want to do a low risk procedure. Just do the horizontal and we just build the, the, the horizontal. We're not trying for the vertical at this point. We just want to make a lot of money first. Then in this case, we did uh, distraction, although we could have done an osteotomy, which would have been probably a little quicker. We brought it down and then we place the our third phase we put the implants in and we do the screw tent pole for pontic site development to get the height then we do our vestibuloplasty against the stage four so as you can see this exact same protocol here there's our vestibule add a free gingival graft and this is how it heals then we place our provisional restoration to start sculpting the soft tissue our final restoration the before you can see the vertical defect based on the pa here and the, how the height is gained here essentially so you know i covered a lot of material in here and i know i just sped right through it because in the interest of time we don't have a lot of you know to to, to go into all the details of this and i don't want to mislead you uh, by implying that these can be fixed by just simply doing following these four steps it's not uh, at all like that uh, I am the editor, the, if many of you in dental school may have remembered the Fonseca textbook in oral and maxillofacial surgery. This is a textbook widely used across the world. Uh, and uh, uh, this is on its third edition. I am you know, the implant editor for this and uh, there are multiple chapters and there are a number of chapters that I've uh, authored in here. And 
by uh, many well-known uh, clinicians around the world. And there is uh, a chap uh, two, uh, ch one chapter by Oli Jensen and Katsuhiro Horiuchi, who are the pioneers or some of the, not the, or, or some of the uh, experts on the technique of osteotomies. And so it goes into much more details on the information that I gave you. So if you want more information on that, you can uh, get this book. It's three volumes over a thousand pages. And uh, just some conclusions. Basically, going back to what we said, bone augmentation may not increase implant survival. So especially in the aesthetic zone. Now, you, if you have just, you know, uh, if you feel that you are not able to achieve it to correct the buccal crest, then just place the implant using pink porcelain. There is no magical procedure. Be careful, especially every five, seven years, somebody comes along and will show you that there is some procedure that you need to learn. And I believe that that is, a, is, is, is dangerous to the profession because complications are extremely common with these procedures and should be expected. And that we have heavy corporations within all our field that are dictating treatment. And so it's creating a lot of confusion and they basically, uh, we as a profession need to stand up and acknowledge that and, and not perpetuate that. Uh, defects occur in three dimensions. You must correct the buccal crest and vertical defects, especially in the aesthetic zone. And in these defects that I showed you are high risk. Little money means little bone means little money. Make them a stage multiple low risk procedures to decrease the risk of severe complication in difficult cases. And so that uh, this is my email. If anybody has any questions, feel free to email me. And again, the textbook uh, also has a lot of information on that. So uh, thank you very much. Um, that was amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. I um, I have I have so many questions. So usually, actually, the the way we're doing these, Dr. Lee. Uh, and let me know how much more time you have. But we, we, this is like a, a blend of a webinar and a, a podcast. So I I, um, I know some of your family members might be showing up. So I want to make sure you get through your lecture. But I have uh, tons of questions and follow up. So uh, let me let me know when you're when you're running out of time. Um, part I think I think some of the things I want to ask oh, you. No, no, I'm good. Yeah. You're good. Okay, good. Because uh, yeah, we, we there's so much I wanted to talk to you about. But and and you know. I, as a general dentist who's been doing surgery for for the last decade, um, you know, just implantology and, and surgery has really changed my life and my practice. And um, there's a lot of questions that I want to ask you and get your opinion because I I, we, I really do look, uh, I agree with you. There's so many different sources of information. Sometimes uh, these are coming from companies and, and sponsorships. And so it's uh, it's refreshing to, to kind of get it from, uh, you know, people who are, who are in academia. Um, for, first and foremost, I, and, and, you know, how did you get into this? And like, what, what, uh, what inspired you to get into, uh, you know, specifically bone grafting? And, and how do you think this is going to play out in the future? Um, could tell, tell me a little bit about like your interest in this and how you got involved in this from the beginning. So, you know, everything happens, uh, for a reason. And, you know, it's interesting cause I, I, uh, I was, uh, I went into academics. I trained in Oregon health sciences university, um, at the, in the, in the 1990s. And, uh, at that time, Oregon health sciences, uh, the program in oral maximal facial surgery, uh, was a very well-known program produced a lot of, uh, you know, huge names in the field of oral surgery that are currently now some of the biggest leaders in the world. But we were really known for doing joint reconstructions, cancer surgery, uh, neck dissections. Um, we had, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the program, uh, you know, chairmen were ENTs and oral surgeons, triple boarded guys. So my training was not in implants. You know, I, my training was in implants but it was not uh, a heavy implant. I did a, you know, maybe 100, 200 implants you know, in my training. So it wasn't, uh, this is again in the 90s. So at that time it might have been considered a lot. So when I was hired to come back here down to USC, I went straight in academics. Um, they didn't even let me do implants uh, when, I, when I was hired. There was, uh, the implant field was very, um, you know, very, a, a very hot field and everybody wanted their fingers in it. Uh, and, uh, you know, the oral surgeons, the periodontists, and me as this new guy coming from another 
essentially a program. I was not a USC bred uh, surgeon. I went into full time. I, I was hired as co-director for the residency program. And so they, it was interesting, and I don't want to mean they, it's just that I was not part of the system. We, we already had our implant guys, all the implant surgeons. So they said, well, you know, Dr. Lee, you're, you, know, you, you do the, the big surgeries and, you know, maybe you, you shouldn't place the implants right now because, you know, you know, especially in oral surgery, if you place an implant, you place it wrong, you know, it's going to make reflect very poorly on, on everybody. So, so I, I, I didn't uh, get to get into implants until maybe one or two years later, and it was by accident. Um, mm -hmm. I was very interested in doing other types of surgery, uh, and so I started uh, uh, teaching CE courses uh, because I was invited by the dean uh, at USC to teach oral surgery for GP classes. Mm -hmm. and so. And so that's how I got started. So I taught my, I, I put together, they said, you know, we need to make some money for the school. And so uh, why don't you, you know, you can't do the implants, but why don't you teach oral surgery for GP classes? And so I put together, uh, uh, I was the director for the oral surgery for GP class. So I put together this uh, oral surgery for GP, but it, which it basically talks about extraction. And so when you extract teeth, now at that time, 20 years ago, the topic of, you know, immediate implant, um, should you graft the socket very early in its infancy? But these were topics that needed to be discussed. And so we started to discuss that. And from that, it's, you know, and the, and the courses were doing very well. We were making, you know, one of the top earners for the school in the CE department at these courses. And uh, the popularity grew and people started to say, hey, you know, can you do a part two on this, uh, on how to, uh, you know, should we place it in there? How do we fix sockets or, you know, we take it out? And so we started teaching that and it evolved to eventually, I ended up with eight courses at USC uh, where I was the director and they were all, the, you know, money talks. And so each one of those courses sold out. You know, we were teaching implant courses on immediate implants, sinus augmentation, horizontal augmentation, vertical augmentation, complications, full arch, and so we had protocol. So, for, so that's how I ended up getting the implants. And I guess you know you grow where you're planted. And and it was and it was at such a nice time. I think all of us for all of us to be an implant because this is such a fascinating field right now, because yeah. um, it is growing so rapidly. And I thought it was a rapidly growing field when I was you know started doing twenty you know teaching it twenty years ago. But I see that it's still exploding. And it's still ch ever changing, especially in, in all these areas. But I also see that that is a double-edged sword. And that's why I, I, I give the lecture the way that I, uh, that I did. Is that the the double-edged sword is that when you have something that grows very rapidly, you have a lot of uh, uh, problems that are associated with it. Things that change quickly only means there's problems. Let me, let me say that another way. If everything is perfect, there's no need to change it. Why do we change from internal, external hex to internal hex? Why do we change from, uh, you know, metal abutment to zirconia? Why do we start, you know, doing every change, every innovation? Why do we go from machine surface to texture surface? And now some people want to go back to machine surface. It's because this circle that I told you about, when you practice long enough, you will see it go full circle. And so you're going to see, and as a, uh, in academics, you know, my residents, they spend six years there and they don't really do a lot of big surgeries until their fifth and sixth year. And that's when I mostly work with them. And so a lot of times they do procedures and they have one to two years to follow the patient. And then I am the one that's left behind seeing these patients four years later, five years later, 10 years later. And that's when I start to see, you know, there's a lot of problems with that technique but they never got the benefit to see that. And that's why I want to share that. And I think that it's so important because of the commercialization of this field. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, we need commercialization. We need corporate support. And I'm, you know, a hundred percent in favor of that, but it has to be very, 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 uh, uh, you know, the, the folks need to recognize, and I think that a lot of people don't. I think a lot of people listen and do not know where that 
there is money speaking behind and uh, behind the technique or behind there's something being sold and so they read and and that you see that perpetuate into the journal articles you see articles that are published and then courses sold um based on those articles that may have poor evidence and it's basically to make money for courses and corporations but i think a lot of people don't see that and i see that but i just think you know i think there's nothing wrong with with, 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 with corporate support, but I think that there's, I think that the, there is a lot of problems associated with that. So, but that's basically my history. I got interested in implants. In no, I, I totally agree. I think uh, I think we're seeing the the corporate interest uh, in medicine and dentistry um, in various different uh, capacities, from uh, from ownership of dental offices to to products and courses. But it's yeah, it's very important. That's why I think these type of platforms are important. We get to get uh, different um, different perspectives, and I think it's just a matter of just constantly going out there and getting more information and then uh, being able to cross-reference that with others. I remember just starting out with, uh, after graduating from USC, um, you know, I, I, I didn't really get a huge background at the time on implants. So just going out there, it was, I was hearing so many different, you know, uh, opinions and taking so many different courses. But I think after a while, you start to see the trends and um, I think your point is well taken. Um, I, specifically talking about some of these things that, that uh, are really um, popular right now. I would really love to get your opinion. Um, I think, for example, let me ask you a question. Like, uh, what are your thoughts on um, on using? You know, we talked about autogenous bone. Um, yeah. How about uh, how about autogenous tooth? Um, I, I I I see a lot of people actually using the actual tooth. Um, I've done that in my office in different capacities and actually grinding up the tooth. And then um, I actually I actually have used uh, the actual tooth uh, for block grafting. Instead of using an allograft, I actually uh, demineralized the tooth and used that as a block with mixed results. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And uh, and also beyond the autogenous, um, you know, bone and tooth, I would lo love to ask you about uh, PRP, CGF, and PRF, and and what you see uh, the future of that in in bone regeneration. Great question. Um, so essentially, you know, the the the, to the topic of uh, using the tooth. I think the, the tooth is a is a perfectly a, a good concept as a space osteoconductive uh, scaffold for um, you know for bone regeneration. I, I it goes back to you know whenever I look at what material to use, how I answer that question when somebody always ask me, you know, what do you use for this? Do you use autogenous bone or do you use allograft uh, or do you use xenograft or do you use alloplast? Everybody has their dog in this fight and everybody, you know, says like, you know, well, I've been using this for 20 years and this works. It really, all of those can work in really high osteogenic sites. So let's take the sinus lift. The sinus lift is a very predictable procedure. Why? Because it has many walls native walls it's very stable so the graph stability is taken into account so there's no mobility there's no effect on the graph and it's protected right so it's, it's a highly osteogenic potential site extraction site same thing in those sites you can put anything in it and it will probably accept the ability for it to, to in other words as a scaffold so a tooth demineralize or you know and then put into there i think it works great i've read lots of studies on it i think it's uh, the only problem with the tooth is that there's just not enough of it that's uh the problem is that you know i don't know if you see those cases that i show you i'm always putting bone right? if i open the flap i pack on bone even though most of those cases when i'm putting implants there's plenty of bone already but yet i'm packing more bone i'm using the bone to sculpt the ridge to sculpt the soft tissue and so and to anticipate resorption so the problem with the tooth is that you know i only have one tooth maybe if i'm extracting the whole mouth and so i don't have that ability to put more and build on top of it so mm -hmm. my technique my protocol is predicated on the ability to build more on top of uh you know and and, and also you know I'm, I'm i'm afraid of resorption and so i i want to be able to have enough and so anyways the secret to doing to correcting the buccal crest is to put the right amount of material and 
if you put too much, you can't close. If you put too little, the graph will migrate away from the buccal crest. There's no point to do a graph if it migrates and you have a ton of bone at the nose or at the apex. That's a failed graph. And that usually happens because you have a wide flap, the graph migrates away. Mm -hmm. So then what do you do to control it? You tack it, your membrane, you try to control it. But the tacking procedure, you're suturing it, it works, but it's a little complicated. In a procedure that is already technique sensitive, I prefer to keep, that's why I keep my flap localized so that I don't have to worry about, you notice those, in, uh, in those cases, I never, I don't tack any of my membrane. I just lay my membrane over because my flap is controlling my graft. So that's why I think using the tooth is the, the disadvantage of the tooth is I don't have enough of a tooth. If I have enough of a tooth, I'd be happy to uh, explore that. And it takes a little bit of time. Time yeah, is money. Let me ask you a question on that point because this was something that I was uh, I was thinking as you were as you were mentioning about the migration of the bone grafting. Um, so that's that's one of the main reasons I use uh, and I you know I I pretty much do this on every implant case. I, most of my surgical cases, I'm withdrawing blood. I'm using a centrifuge and I'm I'm mixing uh, you know the, the the PRP or PRF with the patient's actual bone and I get amazing bone stabilization. And so that's what I wanted to ask you about. If, if, if it's the bone stabilization that's an issue, um, why don't we use these biological, you know, growth factors to help, um, you know, stabilize the bone and then we can actually uh, s stick with some of those larger, you know, incisions away from the actual surgical site. What are your great. thoughts? Yeah, great, great point. So it goes to essentially platelet derived growth factors. Um, it's a, it's a area that is, you know, lots of potential, lots of interest right now, um, lots of debate. Um, I don't think it's as black and white as uh, many people will have you believe. It is also very heavily corporatized. Uh, so, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I'm just saying that, um, let's, look, let's put it this way. Osteogenic potential, you need, so there's three things you need, as we all know, you need the, the scaffolding, the, the, the conductive, and you need the inductive and you need the osteogenic. Uh, so there are um, the most powerful um, inductive and uh, agent out there. W what do you think is, it is? It's BMP, right? So BMP2 mm -hmm. has literally, you know, uh, has significant amount of evidence, preclinical and clinical data. Mm -hmm. You know, I, gunshot wounds, I treat continuity defect, people who, and tumor resection, people who lose their jaw. Um, when there's a low osteogenic, so most of the cases I show today is, you know, fairly straightforward, small localized defect, not, re, you know, large defects that we see at the hospital. So these big defects that we see in the old days, you know, we take iliac crest bone graft uh, and we, uh, to transplant, you know, to, to achieve those three things. The, um, now, slowly over the years, I started migrating away from iliac crest bone graft because, you know, having to harvest the bone and um, it's a significant morbidity for the patient. So we started using uh, a biomaterial and then we started mixing it with BMP. And so we were able to regenerate quite a bit of bone using BMP. So BMP has a lot of, um, a lot of evidence, preclinical and human clinical studies. So, when people say, you know, I use, uh, let's say, the the the, the, the platelet the growth uh, derived growth factors for these defects. If you want to have, you know, true osteogenic potential, I mean uh, induction, use BMP. I can guarantee you, you will have ten times the amount. You'll have bone growing, and you know, I didn't have time to go over the studies and the data. And I, uh, you know, there was a recent study that was published out of Michigan. It was an animal study, split mouth study, comparing, uh, so same dog, one side was allograft with mesh. On the other side, allograft with mesh. But the only difference in intervention was add BMP. Mm. Now, we already know what the result's gonna be. You have higher bone with BMP. You have ectopic bone with BMP. We know this, we know this from lots of, uh, data now, animals and human studies. You put BMB in there, you're going to have more bone. 
It's very evidence-based versus PRP and PRF. We don't have that kind of data. We don't have that randomized control. Now, the current uh, systematic reviews that look at the data on, on PRF with ridge augmentation does not show that. In fact, the conclusions on uh, based on you know, Henny Schlieffaki out of clinical implant uh, research and related research and by um, uh, uh, essentially, we don't have the data to show us for ridge augmentation that it affects clinical outcome. That's just the state we are in today. So mm -hmm. absent that, you know, that strong data where for ridge augmentation, you know, it basically says you don't, it does not uh, change the outcome. If you do split mouth, add the PRF, you're not going to have bone growing out of the, the, the uh, or now with BMP you do. But the point that I want to make going back to this study is this. This study showed that the addition of BMP had ectopic bone had two to three, a two point uh, you know, something millimeter more height than if you didn't use the BMP. But the biggest difference was this, was wound dehiscence. Without BMP, you had like a you know, significant, over half the cases, the wound opened up. Significant dehiscence. Remember I told you about the foreign body reaction. People think, oh, it's because you don't close it right. If you don't close it right, you, you shouldn't be doing surgery. Mm -hmm. So, but when they add BMP, it reduced the dehiscence by 50%. There was an 80% dehiscence in a dog to, four, to 40%, which speaks to exactly what I just told you. When you increase the osteogenic induction potential, you reduce the foreign body reaction uh, of the of the site. The wound doesn't open up. Now, th those are, you know, that's why now when I am doing a case, so the, the use of BMP is basically eliminate the use of, uh, of autogenous bone in my practice. I can do rich, you know, jaw reconstruction, the majority of cases regrow a jaw with use of BMP. Now, having said that, I will, add, I will say this, that unfortunately, this is not available to many parts of the world. Right. Japan. Right. Uh, many parts of Europe. It's not available. So I have I wanna, friends. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I, I want to ask you a question. Sorry, but, uh, you know, because I have a couple more questions. I want to make sure we get in. So I think outside of the osteoinductive or conductive properties, I mean, I've done probably maybe about 10, 15 BMP cases. I mean, they all work great. They have massive swelling and crazy, uh, you know, uh, well, crazy yeah. reaction. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, and, yeah, and I, after I mean, after maybe a decade of doing these, maybe I ventured out to doing BMP. I think my my interest uh, for um, for the utilization of uh, you know PRF and PRP was not really for inductive uh, properties, rather for bone stabilization. So I haven't used a mesh in probably about five years now. I, 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 I used to use them all the time. I, you know, I agree with you. I think introducing these foreign bodies were creating issues, um, even if it was PTFE, but I found that the, the bone stabilization factor, um, really, really helpful. And the studies didn't show that there was, you know, a huge difference, I think, as far as like inductive or conductive properties, but specifically to avoid having to use maybe membranes, I would just overpack, you know, overpack more bone. I would maybe shave off bone using some of these shavers from, you know, in another area. Oh, or I would extract the wisdom tooth and shave in, and grind that down to get a little bit more. Depending, I have kosher patients. I have vegan patients. Um, they, they didn't want any foreign materials. Um, I, but I, I think on a day-to-day you know, the average dentist, the average person getting into this um, is probably not going to jump to using BMP anytime soon. And, I, and really what was interesting to me when I first learned about how to withdraw blood and centrifuge it, um, I really, it was, it was kind of like a religious moment for me. I was like, wow, you know, there's so many things in our own body that can help. I don't, I, you know, I'm doing surgery sometimes in Guatemala and maybe it's cost prohibitive to use membrane there. Um, or, or using tax. And I just found it to be an amazing uh, procedure in, in my hands anyway. And I, and I just routinely do it for all my GBR cases. Um, I do it for a lot of my implants. And then um, I also use, you know, uh, depending on what, what type of uh, cylinder, whether it's glass or plastic, sometimes I use it as a, instead of a membrane. Um, and sometimes I've done my sinus lifts without using any bone. Basically, you know, as long as you have that tenting uh, technique, I just basically withdraw maybe eight eight vials, 
um, I, you know, I, I put the, put, put the CGF in there and, and, and then place my implants immediately. And that gives me the tenting I need. So yeah. What are your, what are your thoughts on that outside of the osteoconductive or inductive nature, as far as just the bone stabilization um, and, and maybe a replacement of, of materials like membranes and meshes? Yeah. Um, you know, the, uh, you know, for, for, for me, I, I, I've, I've gone through a lot of those uh, religious moments uh, in my career also. Um, you know, we started in the, uh, back 20 years ago, I think if you were doing um, a bone augmentation or a sinus lift and you weren't using PRP at that time, you were probably a quack uh, if you were not using it. Mm. Um, because uh, the, uh, you know, I don't want to mention that the names of people who are advocating at that time, mm -hmm. but if you were using it. So, you know, I was one of those that always jump on the wagon early. And I think mm -hmm. that when you're here, you tend to, uh, you know, you tend to buy toys. You tend to, you know, e be easily influenced. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, in fact, I bought the first machines, uh, centrifuge machine for USC, uh, mm -hmm. again, about 20 years ago. I thought we bought two. We bought one for the hospital. Uh, we bought one for the hospital. It's still there. Uh, bought one for the office. I think we're a total of $60,000. Wow. So you know, I, I've gone through a lot of, uh, of, of these moments. And so I, you know, in medicine, one thing that, uh, that, that always sticks with me is that if you introduce an intervention, even drawing blood, like uh, on a patient in the morning, let's say we round on a patient at the hospital and you want to check their white count. And it always been a religious thing that people, that every morning they do that. Or, or let's take an x-ray after we do a tracheostomy or we, it's something that, oh, we always do that. You know, in medicine, one thing that I learned is that you don't ever introduce an intervention if it does not change the outcome or your decision. In other words, each decision leads to another decision. So when you have a fork in the road and you say, okay, well, let's order this test. You should not order a test just to order a test, or you should not introduce an intervention just to introduce intervention. If the outcome of that intervention does not, in other words, if it's positive, it will help you decide to go this way or that way. Or if it's negative, it will help you decide to go this way or that way. So if it's if you're still going to go this way, then there's no reason to introduce the intervention or the uh, so any intervention or test or anything you introduce, no matter how as little uh, risk you think it may be. Oh, you know, it, it may not change the bone, but I think it just helps with uh, you know uh, this, and I'm just doing it. Uh, I believe if you're going to introduce an intervention, because you know time is money, uh, cost. Um, there, there's a lot of other things you can be doing, you know, if it does not change the outcome of the procedure, whatever that outcome may be. Let's say you extract the tooth, you put that in. Now, absent that data, and I'm not saying that there isn't data, and I don't want to be, because I know I'm, I'm in, the, in the hot seat saying this because I know uh, that this is a very, uh, very hot topic right now, and there's mm -hmm. a lot of people that criticize my answer for this and I, and I accept that and I don't really you know it doesn't affect me you know when you get to be 50 something years old that uh, it, it uh, I, I, I I'm not so worried about that but I can tell you one thing is that I've been through all of that and I can tell you that if it does not change my outcome I don't do it mm -hmm. because even time is money and if I have to if I have to spend a little bit of time to do an intervention um, and it does not change the outcome of my you now so people were saying like, you know, oh, I am, uh, you know, doing this because it helps to glue my graft together. There's a mm -hmm. lot of ways to graft together. That mm -hmm. is a lot, they're a lot easier. You don't need to spin that to, to do that. Okay. So I think, you know, I, my advice to, I, th I think, you know, to a lot of folks, and I do a lot of augmentation. Uh, we do uh, it, uh, my overall goal in augmentation is to, you know, I'm worried about the 95% because I hear people say, oh, look, the procedure has a 95%. Oh, you put implants in somebody who's been irradiated, you know, implants 80% successful. I always worry what about the 20%. So the same thing with every procedure is I don't worry about the 90% or 95%. Every procedure, everything that we do, I always tell the students, worry about the 
And so every technique, everything that you introduce, everything that you do, um, you should always, uh, you know, think about the, uh, you know, what happens if you don't do it and what happens if you do it? You know, in other words, if you introduce it, does it change the outcome? Um, but but I, I think that, um, and then the, the data, you know, the data, it has to be evidence-based. You know, we, we uh, and I'm not saying that it isn't. I'm, I'm just saying that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think there's, that, there, there's so much evidence on both sides. And I think, again, as you mentioned, you ask a, on both sides. I would say that it's equal. I would yeah. say that the evidence for it to help with to change the outcome mm -hmm. of at this point does not exist. Not there. Now, I was having a call, I was talking to uh, Gordon Christensen uh, just a couple of months ago uh, about small diameter implants and um, and, and what he believes and, and what he was advocating is the use of some small diameter implants. And now when I hear you talking about shorter implants, um, it, it, you know, this is something that I've always tried to avoid is the shorter implants. So let me give you my, my train of thought and then maybe you can tell me how you think because I'm, I'm speaking from a, a GP's point of view. So my thought process always was, well, look, we're going to get some natural bone loss over the years. Um, we're gonna, you know, there's a there's a definition uh, of what actual failure is, and which is, you know, how many millimeters of bone you can lose around those threads. And so I was I always thought to myself, is you know, I I would I would be scared to put multiple of these short implants because I know we're naturally going to get some bone loss and and you know around those threads. And then also, how how easy is it to maintain the area? Um, you know, clean over a long period of time when when it starts all the way up in the vestibule. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I my my comfort level was like we need to we need to generate some bone, and I'm going to get some natural bone loss over the years. Um, but if I lose, if I'm starting with five millimeters of bone or whatever eight millimeters of bone, and uh, adding pink porcelain, if I'm going to lose some of that bone, it's going to be a disaster when that fails. And then like where am I? What am I going to do now uh, after after you know eight years if that implant fails? Yeah, great question. So, so you know that we have actually quite a bit of data on that. So that really is no longer a point of debate. Meaning, mm -hmm. the use of short implants is uh, is is widely accepted today, based on evidence, on very good evidence actually, um, that it uh, has very similar outcomes in most situations to longer implants, meaning short and extra short implants, meaning before short was defined as eight or less, then it went to six or less, and now we have ultra short, which is four, you know, or less than five millimeters. And interestingly, the shorter it got, the, the, the outcome hasn't, you know, based on different, like I said, outcome measures, the use of short implants have, have performed, you know, surprisingly very, very good compared to native sites. So that's the first thing. Now. To your, uh, and, and this is actually based on um, fairly good uh, uh, long-term data. Um, the only area where it does not perform as well is in early failure, meaning if you place an implant in posterior maxilla, you may have, if you're going to have a failure, an early failure, meaning failure prior to uh, restoration connection, then you'll have it more with a shorter implant, which makes sense than you would with a longer implant. Um, but but so in my practice, these cases that I show you, uh, if I can place a short implant versus augmentation, I always do short implants. It's mm -hmm. not even a question. I don't even say, you know, you know, I get referred all the time. Oh, Dr. Lee, why don't you do this for us? You know, this uh, augmentation. And I if the patient's willing to accept short implants or multiple short implants and split together, I do that every single day. I would, you know, because we have such clear data now. Like, let's say, you know, when you have like a 90% or 95% success uh, survival, uh, prosthetic survival, implant survival, compared to all the best ridge augmentation, vertical ridge augmentation studies you see, you know, it, you have to remember that we have very, very poor data when it comes to ridge augmentation. And most of the studies that we have are case reports and case series. Mm -hmm. And you all have to remember that there's a huge bias towards in these data, in these ridge augmentation data. Why? 
because people want to report positive experiences. If I was doing a procedure, let's say I'm using the tensing screw, I'm using a new technique with PRF, and I had a terrible outcome, or a company was uh, uh, re researching a technique and they had a terrible outcome, I'm not going to report it. Not that I, you know, and I, I take that back. It's not that I'm not, I have less incentive to report that versus if I did this new technique mm -hmm. and, it, you know, and, and also I have selective memory. I want to report because I want to be, you know, I want to become famous, you know, I want to report this new procedure I developed, you know. So people tend to report positive experiences in the implant literature. So you have to be very careful. So the data that we have on these ridge augmentation, it's, you know, and then you have all those, also this monetary reward that you, you, you know, you report, you know, these beautiful cases, and now you have this new, this course that you have, right. you know, people sign up, oh, I, I got to go learn how to do it like you. So people, the, there's a huge bias in the implant literature. Don't believe me, read it, and you'll see, you know, like you see, you see papers published in April and you have a course already starting in, in, in February, you know, to sign up on how to use totally the technique great. and the, to sell with it people report you know so i can't compare to that so based on short implants versus ridge augmentation the data is very clear you know short implants so now long-term bone loss if you're going to get you know studies have shown that bone stability around the implant if it's going to be stable uh, it, that it tends to be stable the cases where it goes south it goes south so if you're going to lose the implant you're going to lose the implant so, mm -hmm. but if it's going to be stable it tends to be stable and that um these are based on the swedish studies that have shown that if the bone tends to be stable, but 98.9% of the time, it's going to remain stable for 10, 20, 30 years. It's, you don't get progressive bone loss around implants. If so let me ask you a question. I, we have still several thousand people still watching this. They're asking questions. So one of the questions they're asking is, uh, you know, what are your thoughts about the, you know, the crown to root ratio that we uh, we learned about, or, or now the crown to implant ratio? So I, I know you briefly mentioned it. So um, maybe maybe just tell us again what what your thoughts are on that, or recommendations, or observations. Yeah. So um, so the you know crown to root ratio. Uh, there's actually, like I said, there's there's a lot of the the, the so. So, I mean, this is a whole discussion on, you know, the topic of basically when you're talking about a short implant, you're talking about uh, excessively loading an implant. And so two things, does it affect biology? In other words, is there biological complications around the implant from excessively loading the implant? And then also mechanical problems. Is there, because you, an implant is a series of multiple joints and the weak link is always the joint. Right. If a wind blows through my house, it's not going to break the door. It's going to tear the door off the hinge. So the joints mm -hmm. are the weak. So when you have a short implant, by definition, you have a long crown. Anytime mm -hmm. you place a short implant, you have a long crown. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the data today that as we have it again, there's a, a lot of data on this. You know, and and you know the question is that you know this this I don't want to take time away from this to to, 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 to cite the data on crown to root ratio and, and, and uh, crown to root ratio does not affect, in general, does not affect the biology and crustal bone loss around an implant. Mm -hmm. Only if, but if the majority of the complications are prosthetic loosening. When you have a long crown and a short implant, what's the weak link? So when you have an implant, traditionally you have six things come together, joints. You have the implant in the bone. That's one. That's two things, right? Now you have the abutment. That's three things. You have a screw. That's four things. You have a metal crown, and then if you have porcelain, that's six things come to six joints come together that you are repeatedly stressing at about 150 newtons. You know, at about 10 to 15 degrees, right? Repeatedly in three years, you have a half a million cycles of that. It's repeatedly stressed. So you have a multiple. You have a uh, repeated stress. It's like a car, the wheels come off if you drive it a lot. Now, now you have a Bruxer, you're gonna have even more stress on that. But what is the weak link in the system? Is it the implant gonna come out of the bone? That's one joint. What's the weakest link of all of that? It's usually the connection, the abutment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's the implant. implant. The screw loosening is the main problem. So when they've done studies, there's actually a classic study that looked at two implants, there were two astro implants placed with the cantilever. One astro with one implant, 
axial loaded, one Astra, two crowns. So I'm sorry, one implant with one crown, one implant, two crowns, same case. Yeah. The distal canal lever. And so they looked at the outcome. They, they want to look at the periodontal health, bleeding, bone loss, and mechanical complications. They followed for five years. What do you think they found what was the difference in terms of biology? No difference in terms of bone loss, no difference in, in health. The only difference was that 25% of the crowns that the distal canal lever came loose. That's true loosening. There's no difference in periodontal health. So crown to root ratio affecting loss of implant and causing periodontal uh, bone loss is is uh, not really, um, it's now a thing that we have started to see is not as significant. It's not a knee jerk as before. Before we thought we had to have the longest implant, we had to have the this. And we know today, it's, and, and that speaks to the power of osseointegration, that you can have, you know, four millimeters of an implant in the bone in a, in a textured implant and it's likely to stick um now that's different than crown to root ratio on a tooth that right. has pdl so that's why the give in the system is usually the screw so if you're gonna have a problem it tends to break there first in the old days before zirconia it was the porcelain that would chip if you had you know repeated be beating on it the porcelain would chip off and now you're using zirconia so you're, you're it's which is a lot harder to, now it's transferring that stress into the screw but to lose the implant or to cause crestal bone loss, the only time it causes crestal bone loss is if the crown is loose, causing a biologic shift in the bone hmm. because of the leakage. So wonderful. So I, I think we're getting ready to wrap up. I think one of the last questions, uh, the last question I have for you, and, uh, and then we'll wrap up is, um, you know, we talked about these cycles and, you know, I, I totally believe in that. I, I agree with you. I think sometimes you want to look to the future. You you should look at the past and see, uh, you know, see what happens because things do happen in cycles. But also there is some progressive change. And I think now um, with the utilization of stem cells and, you know, the advanced technology, we're hoping to see uh, different ways. And one of the things, you know, it, it's funny. Um, Sometimes at these lectures I would go to, I would see retired dentists, maybe in their like late 80s, still coming and just wanting to learn and, and they're, you know, in endo or whatever was of great interest to them. To me, it's always been bone grafting. And I always looked at uh, this possibility of regenerating the bone. I tell all my patients, I said, look, your teeth are great, but I'm actually more concerned about the bone. You don't have bone, you don't have teeth. And you can't even put, put implants. So I'm, I'm really interested in like, what does the future hold for us? And do you think we're going to get to a point where it, before we even lose the teeth, we can regenerate some of these bones back up? Or, you know, now I think we're going to personally, I think we're going to start to see maybe possibly some cluster failures as far as like implants and so many people who are trying to place implants now, maybe some under trained dentists trying to get into implantology. And I'm worried about the amount of bone loss we're going to get around these implants. Um, what are your thoughts about the future as far as before augmentation? Before, before ridge augmentation, before we actually lose the teeth, before maybe we lose some of these implants and have to take them out and graft the area. Do you think uh, we're going to get to a place soon where we can actually regenerate some of the bone and start grafting some of these teeth and implants? And um, yeah, that's that's going to be me the, the, uh, when I'm 85 sitting in on these uh, classes trying to, you know, see where bone regeneration occurs. Because I think that's going to be where we'll actually yeah, be able to save some of these teeth. That, that's an interesting question. I mean, I... I you know, I'm, I'm on a, a lot of different committees mm -hmm. with a lot of different experts, and uh, actually was part of the AO consensus statement um, when we had the uh, meeting in 2014 uh, or 16 on um, uh, the atrophic ridge. And uh, the one thing that I, 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 I always, so, so these topics are always brought up, what's the future, you know, of bone augmentation, and of course, you know, there's always a lot of exciting things, um, you know, with with uh, bone augmentation. But in terms of clinical reality and relevance, I think we are way, way, way far. We're still far away from uh, from the day where you know we can regenerate to the perfect state, uh, or even pro prophylactically bring uh, uh, regenerate back. And the reason why I say that is. As a, a human biology, um, you know, if you were to lose an arm or a leg uh, or uh, lose certain parts of your body, we can recreate it. Yes, we have the technology and we have lots of modalities, lots of vehicles to get there.
But as I was telling you before, the goal is not just to put a bunch of bone into a spot, but to regenerate it, uh, especially today's topic with the aesthetic, is to regenerate it so that it looks normal, you know, to where and the controlling that I think is is the biggest challenge. Hmm. Um, bone augmentations, the first bone augmentation was done uh, with allograft or biomaterial was actually done like uh, 200 years, you know, previously. And here in 2020, we're still arguing. We still have seven <laughs> techniques on just that one slide that I showed you. Yeah. So that just tells you that, you know, we, we're, we're so far away. You know, we, yeah, the, the, it's one thing to have one little, you know, with stem cells and all this and that, but, it, it, but to bring it into clinical reality to where we know how it works and, and where its clinical relevance and outcome is, it's going to be beyond both of our lifetimes, you know, but it's interesting. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll I'll be attending uh, I'll be attending classes until uh, until my dying years. And um, uh, Doc, I really appreciate. It. We can talk about this for weeks, and uh, we there's so much good information, so many questions. But we really appreciate you taking uh, the time on, uh, on on a Saturday to share your knowledge. And we look forward, hopefully in the future, to be able to do a follow up with you. And uh, and you really, as I mentioned, I think some this information has a butterfly effect. Uh, a, a lecture and some slides you showed, you know, several years ago inspired me to share that with uh, with my best friend who ended up going to oral surgery and, and uh, really focusing on on bone grafting. So I certainly appreciate your time and everything that you do, and uh, really really want to thank you on behalf of uh, the Global Summit and the rest of our viewers. Rosh, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity and uh, the ability to chat with you uh, on a Saturday like this. Uh, it's really, really uh, very meaningful and uh, a good opportunity to share, you know, at least a, a little bit of my experience with some of the folks worldwide. And I wish everybody out there the best of luck um, in their practice and getting through this pandemic. Of course, you know, we will get through it. And, uh, you know, and I hope to see everybody uh, at a meeting so we can have, uh, enjoy a drink and, and discussion of all this stuff back uh, one day. So I look forward to seeing everyone. Likewise, looking forward to it. Thank you so much, Doc. Have a wonderful weekend and we'll talk to you soon. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.